Welcome back, dear friends, to another exciting episode of Exploring the Dispensation of Baha'u'llah. This is part three of part 21, covering paragraphs 91 through 95. And without any further ado, dear friends, we'll have our opening prayer. Thank you so much. O thou who art the Lord of Lords, I testify that thou art the Lord of all creation and the educator of all beings, visible and invisible. I bear witness that thy power hath encompassed the entire universe, and that the hosts of earth can never dismay thee, nor can the dominion of all peoples and nations deter thee from executing thy purpose. I confess that thou hast no desire except the regeneration of the whole world and the establishment of the unity of its peoples and the salvation of all them that dwell therein. Baha'u'llah. Beautiful, Miss Claudia. Thank you so much. Excellent. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. So, dear friends, we are studying one of the World Order of Baha'u'llah letters, if you're joining us for the first time. So we are studying the dispensation of Baha'u'llah. And the dispensation of Baha'u'llah is the sixth letter from the beloved guardian in the world order of Baha'u'llah. It was written by the beloved guardian, Shoghi Effendi, February 8th, 1934. And right now we are studying the section, the administrative order. And... If you're just watch, you know, catching up right now, you have to go watch the previous videos, <laughs> starting with the Blessed Bab, Baha'u'llah, Abdul Bab. Now we're on the section, the administrative order, okay? And we're picking up from, from where we were last week, okay? In our session last week, we were studying um, and reviewing the hands of the cause of God. We were talking about the hands of the cause of God that had um, been appointed as well as either appointed posthumously or appointed as through the contingents. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to share my screen with you. So this is where we were, okay? We were talking about all, uh, these were the hands of the cause appointed by the beloved guardian First contingent, okay? So this is the first contingent. Dorothy Beecher Baker. We talked about her in our study um, uh, during the advent of divine justice. She was one of those exemplary luminaries, one of those incredible handmaidens of the cause of God. And she passed away at sea. This was actually her prayer. And she wanted to... Um, uh, sacrifice herself for the beloved guardian and it, and your and her prayer constant prayer was that she would enter into the sea and be lapping at the shores of Akka so that every time it would go in and out it would be like she would be prostrating herself to the threshold of Baha'u'llah in truly incredible and we find that um in the book that is um, on Dorothy Beecher Baker. It's an incredible book. I encourage you to read the story on Dorothy Baker. From copper to gold. From copper to gold. Exactly, exactly, Zamri John. It's, it's an incredible book um, dedicated um, about her life story. Amelia Collins, another incredible soul. Um, the generous benefactress. Um, of the faith. Really, what an incredible lady. We also covered her in our Advent of Divine Justice class. Um, truly, truly, if, dear friends, if you want to learn generosity, study her life, study who she was, study um, how, in what a soul she was, not just of material wealth, but of her life, how much she gave of service and how quickly, how quickly she jumped 
at the will of the beloved guardian. There is that incredible video I shared in our Advent of Divine Justice class that, um, um, and there's a, a small line in it that always hits home when I hear of Amelia Collins. It's Amelia Collins memorized one line of the beloved guardian. And that one line was, it was actually from Abdul Baha. It was a one line from Abdul Baha referring to the beloved guardian. And that one line was, make sure the beloved guardian will be happy. Make sure he is, will be happy. You know, and Amelia Collins took that one line and put that in our whole life. You know, and that is something that, dear friends, that is something every one of these souls, except for this guy down here, okay? And that's at the end of his life, okay? And that's at the end of his life. Every, he actually was an incredible hand of the cause of God, too, okay? But at the end of his life, he went astray. And we're not going to go into that uh, in this course, okay? But the reality is these hands of the cause are so exemplary, such luminaries in their lives that every one of them are worthy of emulation. Except as I mentioned this one at the end of his life, okay? And we're not going into that, okay? Now, Ali Akbar Frutan, we talked about, um, I, I had the privilege in my life to meet Mr. Frutan. And I, I, I don't know how many hands of the cause of God my dear classmates have had the privilege of meeting. And Mr. Frutan, what an incredible soul. And um, he's, he was, uh, uh, truly, I was, even at a very young age, I felt as dust in his presence of how rich, I mean, he's serving on the, Iranian National Spiritual Assembly, you know, and uh, what uh, services uh, Mr. Frutan rendered in Russia, in, in the World Center, and, you know, uh, the, the travels that he, uh, he did uh, for the faith, truly. Mr. Giacheri, Yuvo Giacheri, this uh, hand of the cause of God, secured the marble for the World Center. You know, if that was singly alone, only thing he did, <laughs> truly astounding. I mean, if the entire World Center is marble, but he was the one that secured it. And it was during a very tough time. Read the history on it. How and, and the timeline, the beloved guardian needed that marble for the archives. And then so the how the read the priceless pearl. That's it, the end section of the Priceless Pearl, the last chapters. How Hugo Giacheri, God did that for the beloved guardian as a sign of love, sign of love for the beloved guardian. Truly, their sacrifices, their amount of um, work that they did to orchestrate their actions is everything was a sign of love. So we talked actually about all of these um, hands of the cause of God last time. George Townsend, his incredible book, The Mission of Baha'u'llah, Christ and Baha'u'llah. These are incredible books. I encourage you, if you haven't read them, read them, read them, because every one of them are fascinating, as well uh, as incredible introductions to the cause, The Mission of Baha'u'llah, fantastic. Christ and Baha'u'llah, an incredible um, definitive book to present to a Christian, on a Christian audience on uh, Christ and Baha'u'llah. So, because um, he was a minister himself coming from the, 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 the clergyhood, George Townsend. He also has the unique, um, the unique um, gift by the beloved guardian by titling the beloved guardian's book, God Passes By. So that is another pretty cool, you know, um, something that George Thompson has for all time. Valiola Varga. This is 
Mr. Vargas' um, son. His father was a um, hand of the cause of God too. Uh, Ruhula it was um, it was Ruhula and Valiol, a grandson, I believe, his grandson. This is Mr. Vargas, because uh, there was Varga, the one that was in chains with his son, Var uh, Ruhula. I believe this is his, is, is his grandson. Am I right, Farzad John, on this? I believe this is correct. I'm not sure, son. I think that is his son. Is it, is it his son? It's his son. Okay, very good. Because then if it's his son, then this is then Valiola Varga would be the brother of Ruhula. Is that correct? That I don't think timeline. I think it would be his grandson. I have to look this up because it's it, it, based upon 1884 to uh, to 1955. I have to look that up, but that's an interesting point. If it's if they're the brother of is Valiola Varga, do you the, even know if they're related? Yeah, I know they're related because the Vargas are related. They're they're it's from the same family. Yeah. Because that was one of the, um, yeah, yeah. The, you're talking so, about the Vargas and Ruhollah, the martyrs, right? Exactly, the, exactly. The that exactly. Was, uh, during, during, that was during, during, during Baha'u'llah's time. Exactly. Then, oh, yeah, your, the timeline would say that, yeah, they would be the, but I'm not sure if they're that related. You may be, yes, uh, John, I'm not sure. If, the, if, this Vargas. Yeah. This Vargas. Yes. If we may interrupt. Please. Uh, thank you so much. Last time you informed us about the four volumes on YouTube of the Hands of the Cause. Of yes, 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 yes. Arzad and I have watched the first three. They're beautiful. Excellent. They're They're awesome. If anyone has not taken the time, please do. They're wonderfully um, descriptive, expl explanatory, explanatory, ex explanatory, explanatory and tell you a lot about the history of the faith. And yeah. so what I was trying to say was in the first three, showing all of the Vargas, nothing was mentioned about them being related. That's why I'm asking. I'll send it to the class, okay? I'll send it because yeah, I believe they are related and I'll send that no, to- The value of life is the father of the- Vargas. Yes, the, but the-, yeah. the the oh, you're about the martyrs from that bar. I'm not yeah, sure. I believe I, I believe there's a relation between the Vargas. Okay? okay, I'll send that to the class. Okay, okay. As far as you know, I sorry to interrupt you guys. Please, uh, please. Uh, as far as I been in Holy Land and I talked to Muhammad Ali Varka, I think is a head of the Huhuhula. He's a son of the Vargas. That they are descended during the Baha'u'llah the Baha time. That's what I know. So they are related. They are the same. Thank you very much, dear Tesfai. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. And as mentioned, um, this one, Charles Mason Remy, he um, later on um, uh, became a covenant breaker. And um, he was a uh, hand, uh, hand of the cause of God just like the rest uh, appointed in the first contingent, but um, um, after uh, the passing of the beloved guardian in 1957, um, he um, declared himself as the second and the uh, second guardian. And um, as uh, there is, there was no per se will and testament of the beloved guardian, Actually, the dispensation of Baha'u'llah is per se the will of testament. And it's uh, even very clearly in the will and testament of Abdul Baha. It says that it has to be an Aqsan from the family of Baha'u'llah. So all of these, and uh, there was very clear that the beloved guardian, um, there was going to be no other guardians. It was very clear. Um, so... Uh... May Please. I ask you something here on this? Uh, some, somebody that used to be reaching, you know, on the high level in the phase and then he become a hand of the cause and then 
so much mature and deepen himself like that, how can he become a covenant breaker <laughs> as you, in your personal point of view? You so ever, that means my we, dear Tesfai, you, you actually we asked this guaranteed. question. You know when you ask this question, my dear Tesfai, this is not the first time you asked this question. You asked this question when we were talking about Ibrahim Khairullah in Advent of Divine yeah. Justice. And the, this is a, the very same question. When you are so close, you know, to, to the sun, in the sense, you're so close. And, and uh, you know, it's very easy to think of yourself as being on the same station as that's, the sun. That's why I'm thinking now, because... We you know? are not guaranteed on this phase because how far we go, because uh, this is a lesson for us, how much we are going to deepen and how much we're going to be strong mm -hmm. through to the end. Right. Otherwise, we are not guaranteed to be Baha'i. And then sometimes people, they think by becoming Baha'i, when we pass away, we go to the Abha kingdom, but there is no direct line to go over there. Exactly. You're absolutely right. Very good. Okay, so the second contingent. Now, the beloved guardian appointed a second contingent. So these are the appointees of the second contingent. Mr. Shola Alai, Musa Banani, uh, Miss Clara Dunn. If you remember, we studied the Dunns, the champions of Australia. Zikrala Khadem and Adelbert Mushel. Legal. I can. I always slaughter his the, his last name. Mirschlegel. I love you, Miss Yudo. That's why you're here. God bless you. One more time. Mirschlegel. Mirschlegel. And if you could kindly say Siegfried, Siegfried uh, also his last name, if you could kindly, Siegfried. Schofflocher. Schofflocher. One more time, dear Miss Yuda. Schofflocher. Shop. Flocher. I, 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 I'm not as good as you, Miss Yuda. God bless you and your beautiful accent uh, that is, pronounces it so well. Okay. And Miss Corinne True. So this was part of the second contingent. Okay. And every one of these, and in this second contingent, I encourage you to study their lives. Truly, every one of them. Um ambassadoresses or ambassadors of the faith everywhere they go, um, from pioneering posts to uh, sacrifices of life. I mean, truly, what they did, the moment they heard of the faith, and encourage you, find out who is Corinne True, the one that made, really brought the temple to being in this country with Siegfried, I didn't, I didn't say his last name. Siegfried and Miss Corinne True. Both of these souls, really the mother and father of the temp, the, the, the mother temple in the West. Um, Zikro Lachadev, pioneering here, pioneering there. Miss Clara Dunn, mother of Australia. What an, uh, with her incredible husband. Also hand of the cause of God. We talked about him, Mr. Hyde Dunn. So, Musa Banani, he, pa he passed away in Uganda because he was constantly, uh, he was a champion of the African continent, Kampala. He was a champion pioneer going up and down with if you, uh, another hand of the cause of God, Enoch Olinga. And Enoch Olinga also, he was, um, he was martyred in, on, during his services as the really as the, a champion, uh, as a, truly a lion at the threshold of, of pioneering and service and sacrifice. These are for these, every one of them, I encourage you to read, study. Who are these people? And then the question is for each one of you, how can I, how can I learn something from them? and bring that home into here. What qualities do they have that I may work on in myself? Okay, let's look at any one of them. Oh, Miss Corinne True. What is she, what's unique about Miss Corinne True? What is unique about Miss Clara Dunn that's different? 
Faraz or John or Zamri, John? I love you guys. What's the what's question? Go ahead. Um, Ehsan John, <clears throat> you have said not to Google when you would ask us questions. I but... hope you haven't Googled. I saw, I'm I getting there. You. I, I knew you would. I knew you would. Okay. Mirza Valiullah Varga uh -huh. was born in 1884. Uh -huh. He was the son of Varga, the, the martyr Lord. poet. So there you go, the yes. son. I knew they were related, okay? So, so Ruhollah, the son who was martyred with his father, was 12 years old and was mm. his brother. But obviously, he was much, much younger then. There you go. Okay. So, yeah, I knew there was a relation. I just I hadn't done the dates and actually studied it very clearly. So, uh, Mr. Mahmoud, Ali Mahmoud's Yes, so Ali Muhammad. Barga, that was the martyr was his grandfather and Valiola was his father. There you go, grandson. I knew it was the, it was the grandson. There you go. Excellent. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. And Testifier was very correct. Thank you very much for that information. Perfect. Thank you so much for Googling that. Okay. And so this is the second contingent. Now we go to the hands of the cause appointed individually. Now these are not a contingent. These were per se individually chosen, okay? So Agnes Baldwin Alexander, what a lady, what a lady. Champion of Japan. She was a champion of Japan, okay? And Hawaii, the islands. She was an incredible, incredible lady. I encourage you again, if you don't know much about Agnes Alexander, read. What an incredible lady. And there's a, I'll send the class. There's a wonderful um, like minute and a half video. It's on YouTube of Ri Khanum describing Agnes Alexander. It's so cool to have a one hand of the cause of God Describing another hand of the cause of God and the love from Rihanu describing Agnes Baldwin Alexander. And she was speaking at uh, a youth conference in Hawaii. And remember, Hawaii is the place of birth of Agnes Baldwin Alexander. So that's her home place. And she, so she is talking, and she also passed away in Honolulu. And so she's talking with such reverence to the station of Agnes Alexander and that every her every Baha'i that pioneers should call out the name Agnes Alexander you know and know about Agnes Baldwin Alexander and she's a type that maybe only second to you know to Martha Root in her sack in her in her in her services, truly, she was a, so dedicated. Paul Haney, truly, another incredible Baha'i. Encourage you, read. Who is Paul Haney? Jalal Khazet. Jalal Khazet appointed by the beloved guardian. I can't go into every single one of these. I have so many stories on every one of them. And then, obviously, Rui Khanum. Rui Khanum. If you want to get glimpses of the awesomeness of Rihanna, read, read Priceless Pearl, because you read, read the, the book, The Guardian, because not only because you get to see that facet of her, you know, in the Priceless Pearl, because you see her personality, her heart in it. And it's so beautiful. Uh, you get the... Um, who Rui Khanum is, even as you're reading about the beloved guardian. And uh, we talked about also Mr. Varga, another one um, that I had the privilege of meeting um, in Haifa. So yeah, he was the last of the hands of the cause of God was Mr. Varga. So Hassan Valiuzi, this is now the third contingent, the third contingent appointed by the beloved guardian. Hassan Valiuzi. Now, if you don't know who Hassan Valiuzi, where are you? You should have been reading the books of Hassan Valiuzi, right? Go read them. Abdu'l-Baha, the center of the covenant of Baha'u'llah. Baha'u'llah, the king of glory. 
read the great masterpieces of Hassan Baliusi, Abul Qasim Faizi. What uh, he, his um, the he, he, Abul Qasim Faizi he's written the the fire. It's called um, it's an awesome uh, mini uh, compilation on on um, my brain is. Uh, it's called uh, Fire. I have to look it up. Sorry. It's a wonderful little mini compilation on by Abu Ghaz and Faizi. And it's, uh, he also has written, has wonderful talk on the hidden words that I encourage you. I will send it to the class. And it's a wonderful talk on the hidden words. And so many, um, and one of the sad things, another thing that I also want to share is, there is not that many writings or and audio recordings of the early hands of the cause of God. There isn't many. So, for example, I when I was was doing the presentation on in Advent to Divine Justice on Martha Root, we have a lot on Martha Root, who she was. But we have only maybe one audio recording of her speaking, and it's a prayer, and it's short. And that's to me, it's it's sad, you know. How you know now we live in an information age; everything can be recorded. How awesome it would have been if those hands would have been around today, you know? We could have recorded everything, every moment. But I guess it just wasn't meant to be. That their time was for that point. And now the ones that passed away in England, right? So this one was Hassan Baliuzi passed away in England. John Farabi passed away in England. Ramatullah Mahajar, what, one of the lions of pioneering. Pioneering, Mahajar. Enoch Olinga, another incredible lion that was really was with Musa Banani opening up Africa. John Robarts, read his life. He wrote an incredible, uh, he wrote, uh, not wrote, but, but he gave an incredible talk. I'll send it to the class. John Robarts, it was an incredible talk on um, prayer. I believe it was on prayer, the mystical aspects of prayer. When obviously William Sears and his incredible humor. I so, um, but his incredible talks on teaching. My uh, in when when I first um, was elected to the Spiritual Assembly in Houston, I share this anecdote. Um, the Spiritual Assembly at that point in time, also there. We had an arm called the Teaching Committee in Houston. Now, in this day and age, we have area teaching committees and everything like that. But we also had a teaching committee in Houston. And I, I also served on the teaching committee when I was in Houston. And I wanted to so spur the, the teaching activities in Houston. So one of the things that I did was all the talks of William Sears, I made it into videos. And so that was something, and I shared them on YouTube. Zamrui John, you have a hand, please. Wipe those, I'm trying to wipe those off, but I think the book, the compilation you're referring to is The Flame of Fire. I knew it. I knew there was some the fire business. Fire. You're right. So <laughs> yeah, my, my mind escapes me. Flame of Fire, it's an awesome compilation. You're absolutely right. And that's an Abel Gossam Faisi. Uh, Flame of Fire, okay? It's online. You're absolutely right. I, um, flame of fire. Okay. So there you go, dear friends. So this is my last slide in this section. Overall, the Baha'i administrative order is significantly different from any other institutions developed in previous dispensations. It is also distinct from any man-made systems and institutions governing society at present or in the past. Now, before we enter part 22, covering the next paragraph set, 
I'm going to answer my dear friend Tesfai's question from last week. And if you uh, were with us, his question was, where did, um, how many hands of the cause of God passed away in Haifa? Okay. And that was one, that was, you know, his question. And, um, but I actually researched all of them. Where did they all pass away? So, so my question to you, the class is, does any, can anyone guess where the most hands of the cause of God passed away and how many? Okay. So where did most of the hands of God pass away? In Haifa. And is the, who is saying that? Me. Who is me? Claudia. Oh, Miss Claudia, you are right, Miss Claudia. You are absolutely right. Okay, but before we get to the number, how many hands of the cause of God from Baha'u'llah to the third contingent were they? Were there? Okay, and don't suddenly look them up, okay? Okay, how many hands of the cause of God were they? Were there? Anyone? In the 50s? In the 50s. Amaris John is saying in the 50s. You're right. It is in the 50s, okay? Can anyone, okay? Does, does anyone know, can want to give a guess? Because it is in the 50s, you're right. 57? Miss Claudia is throwing out the number 57. Because Is it because number seven is lucky? Is your, you want to go 57? <laughs> no, it just struck me. I think I read somewhere. Well, 1957 is the passing of the guardian. Yes. So that yes. might be the, that's where you're hearing 57. But the answer is no, there wasn't 57 hands. So you're, the, to, to answer your question, it's not 57. Two more guesses, and then we'll, we'll I'll give you the number. Okay. So anyone other than Miss Claudia, um, you can have a, a go at it. Are you asking the number of the hand of the course? That's right, dear Tesfaya. How many hands? Uh, I think there are 52. 52. And where did you get this number, dear Tesfaya? 52. Is it, you know, because there's 52 weeks in a year? Or is it, where did this number suddenly emerge from? Because every time, you know, the uh, uh, Baha'u'llah and uh, Abdul Baha and Shoghi Afendi, uh, three of them are hiring, you know, this uh, hand of the cause in different times. Uh -huh. So I try to add them, all of them together to be 52, if I'm not mistaken. You're definitely mistaken, dear Tesfaya. It's not 52. So it's not 52, okay? So we move to the third guest, okay, from our dear class. So anyone other than dear Tesfaye and Miss Claudia? I anyone? don't know why, but I want to say 54. I think it's 54. I'm oh, Fariza John has jumped to 54. I give Zamruhi John, do you think he's right? I'm stuck between 54 or 56. She is stuck between 54 and 56. You are both wrong. It's okay. not 54 and it's not 56. So the number is 50. Okay. So there were, because your first guess was correct. There, it's in the 50s. So I had to let you say that's correct. So there were 50 hands of the cause. Okay. From the, uh, the uh, four appointed by Baha'u'llah, then four appointed by Abdul Baha. Okay. And then after that, all the others. Okay. So you can look that up yourself. I don't, I'm not going to go individually through all the appointed, the posthumously uh, uh, appointed and everything like that. But there were 50 hands, okay? okay. Now we go to the, the other question. You, you, Miss Claudia said correctly, Haifa Israel was the top choice 
not choice. They're not choosing to die there, but the, the, the top location for the passing away for the hands of the cause. Okay. Now, how many hands of the cause of God passed away in Haifa? Ooh. Seven. So dear Tesfai has thrown out the number seven. Is this because it's a lucky number for a lot of people? Or do you have any insight on this, dear Tesfai? Or are you just guessing? I'm just thinking there are some of them try to count in my mind because uh, uh -huh. I know four of them are already in my mind and then the rest. Yeah, uh, I think I'm sure that they're going to be not more than seven. You're sure that it's not more than seven. Very interesting where you get that idea. You're actually completely wrong. It's actually them. more than seven. Okay. I can name them, uh, but uh, I don't know if I'm not mistaken. because No, no, you're absolutely mistaken, dear Tesfai. It's more than seven. Okay. So so it's definitely more than seven. So I am I assure you that. So now um, let us have uh, one more guess from, some, from someone in the class. For Haifa... Does it, can anyone think of how many? And this is for bonus points if you get hit the number, as they say. Okay. Can anyone think more than seven? 11. 11. Now we're getting multiple people on the number 11. The answer is 10. 10. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> you guys were getting close. So 10 yeah. hands of the cause of God passed away in Haifa. So pretty amazing. Now, our, there is a tie, okay, for second place of, okay? So can you think of the two countries that have second place? Egypt, Argentina. Egypt and Argentina. Okay. Iran. Egypt, Iran. Oh, Miss Yuda. Ding, 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 ding. She got one of them. I love it, Miss Yuda. Iran is one of them, okay? And the other place. I'm not sure if you're going to get the second place. It's very interesting. I think somewhere in Europe, but they are in Portugal and everywhere, a lot of places. So You know said Argentina. Argentina doesn't even have a hand of the cause of God passing away, just for your information. It, uh, we, have, we have one or two of them. In Argentina. Um, yes. We have. Let, let me look that up. Argentina. Um, I, as far as I know, I looked them all fifty up. There's not a hand in Argentina that has passed. There should be one because I no. read a long time ago. I no. don't know the name. I remember. No, it's. Um, I'll, I'll send that also to you. All the places and everything. Okay, so uh, Iran is number is is uh, also tied for second. There's yeah. where is the sec where is the other place? Germany. Where where Miss Zamru Hijan? Germany. 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 Germany is on the list, but it's not even close to being um having the being how the about same. Egypt? Egypt is actually tied with Germany, so it's not on. It's not yeah. on as this as a tie for second, okay? Brazil. <laughs> there is no hand in Brazil. Okay, that's in like. America. They've been teaching a lot. Okay, okay. Okay. Africa. Africa is not a country, dear Zamri John. It's a continent. Okay, just for your information. Um, so, um, but. You could pick uh, any country in Africa. There's quite a few of them. Um, how about India? Indonesia. What country do you live in right now, by the way? United States. United <laughs> States, right? United States of America. The descendants of the Dawnbreakers. Coincidence that it's also tied with Iran, the birth, the cradle of the faith? Yeah. I don't think so. I think that's not a coincidence. So United States and the cradle of the faith, Iran, are is tied for second. Now, what what is how many hands passed away in second place in these two in these countries? 
it's obviously less than 10, right? So, oh, yeah, should be. So, so how many? Like maybe in Iran, five. More. And in America, maybe five, two. So you think it's five each in both of those? Yeah, not more than that. Dear Tesfaye, you are incredibly wrong again in both accounts. So it's more than five. It's actually, really? it's more eight. Than five? It's eight, okay? Oh I know, right? Wow. I, 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 was, I was honestly, you know, blown away that there was eight hands of the cause of God resting in America as United States. Did you know that? Eight hands of the cause of God. It's quite amazing. So that's something that, you know, when you're traveling throughout the great United States, you should go and try to make visit their resting places and say your prayers at their resting places. So then number three, okay, number three, where is number three? Okay, so there was first is Haifa, then Typhor second, you get the silver medal, you know, it's not a medal, obviously, it's sec Typhor places for resting places for hands of the cause you have united states and iran then where would the third place be this is quite interesting where England, would canada ding what a brilliant dog you are canada canada it is you're absolutely spot on canada okay canada it is and canada is also the where was the advent of divine justice written for it was written for the North American Baha'i community of the United States and Canada, Canada, right? So Canada, how many hands of the cause of God passed away in Canada? Four. Four. I love it, Miss Yuda. You're absolutely spot on. So I'm going to tell you all the places. Iran, Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan is one, is an, is a, is one of them too. Okay, uh, Australia has two. Okay, that, and guess who the Australians are? The Duns. The Duns, of course, the Duns. God bless them, right? Okay, then there's Myanmar, which is uh, Said Mustafa Rumi. There's two in Cairo, which is obviously Egypt. Okay, um, that's the Abdul Jalil Bey Saad and Muhammad Taghir Isfahani. Okay, then there's the four in Canada, there's uh, two in Germany, and there's one in the Mediterranean Sea. Who is that one? Uh, nope, Dorothy Beecher Baker, Beecher. right? She was the one that entered into the sea. Yeah, right? burned with the ashes, she was a buddy. Right, okay. Yeah. Then there's one in Western Samoa, that's Yugo Giacheri. There's two in Uganda. Okay. Who are who was the two in Uganda? Musa Banani and Mr. Olinga. Absolutely. Olinga. Great job. Jake, great job. There was two in Italy, but I'm actually counting it as one and a half because you know one of them became a, a covenant breaker. But so <laughs> <laughs> right. So <laughs> I know, but, he's not, but he, it says hands of the cause of God, you know, so, yeah, that is right, <laughs> so, so, uh, but uh, who, the other, the, but this is just interesting, you know, the, to, to see where did they eventually end up, one of them, re uh, resting place was in Western Samoa, that was Yugo Giacheri, I mean, it shows that he was traveling, pioneering, giving talks, even to his last days, that his, his resting place is in Samoa. Two in England, Hassan Baliuzi and John Farabi. And one in Nepal, Collis Featherstone, and one in Ecuador, that's Mohajer. So there was no, none in um, Argentina um, and, okay. and, and yeah, anywhere else. Okay. But there was, that's not to say there was incredible people going and pioneering like Lenora Armstrong, you know, what's an incredible lady. She was sacrificing going to these different places. So 
Um, so, dear friends, that was just a, per se a fun, you know, I don't know how fun it is to look at where people have passed away, but it's, it's, it's interesting to, yeah. to learn about this, um, where, um, per se, these great souls resting places are. So if you happen to reside in any of these places or get to visit any of these countries, take time to go visit their resting places, say prayers and remember them in your thoughts and um, uh, as you say your prayers and everything. So moving on to our next part, checking our time, 7.50, we're doing great. May so we're I going... summarize this, so one that you talk about it? Go ahead, dear Tessai. Yeah, you know, the reason that I ask this question is because it's come to my mind about the hand of the cross is to be one of the foundations of the faith to spread all over the world. And then as Baha'u'llah say in his holy writings, immerse yourself in my ocean of my words. He say, now when you immerse yourself in the hand of the causes, how they are teaching as a standard of the Baha'i characters and wisdoms behind them that we are learning and this Beautiful souls leave their homeland and go sacrifice all over the places that they passed away. And then that will be a lesson for the new generations that we have to be sacrificed their time, their money, their life, so everything. And this faith, we can't get it as a gift to be Baha'i. So we have considered all these things and then shape up ourselves and get ready to do something for ourselves. That's why I just want to know about these things. Thank you very much for bringing all the data. Beautifully said. Thank you, dear Tesla. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, dear friends, we're going to our next part. I'm very happy to share this. So here we go. So let us get into our next part. This our next paragraph set is paragraphs 96 through 100 okay paragraph set 96 through 100 and if someone asked you how many paragraphs are in the dispensation of baha'u'llah can anyone uh, answer that 103 in total in paragraphs yeah 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 how many paragraphs in the dispensation of baha'u'llah 131 131, Doug. Is this a guess, dear Doug, or you or you have insight knowledge? Well, I, I I numbered them for for the purposes of this course, so I just really, yeah, I, I numbered them in my book. I don't know unless you look on the book, but this is a very hard question. In That's interesting. Okay. How many? I have 127, dear Doug. So I'm. I don't know how you got to one thirty-one, but I'm. Unless God has one thirty. Okay, I I will double. I, I have. I let let me check uh, here. I have my whole dispensation. Ask that question. I know that, you, but no questions are good. That's why we should always ask questions, right? Let me see. Let me see, because that is a that makes. That makes me interested. Did I just, did I, what happened that I, so I'm going to double check that. Okay, here we go. Give me two seconds. I'm curious, uh, you say that we're now going to begin on a paragraph 96. Mm -hmm. And my paragraph 96, but I think it's paragraph 96, begins the administrative order, which ever since Abdul Baha's ascension. Are we in agreement that that's paragraph 96? Paragraph 96 starts, okay. Let it me should see. be noted. It should be noted in this connection. So if that's the that's the one, then Farzad is 130. Because it, Doug 96 is, it should be noted. Okay, so my error, at least one of my errors is before this. Okay, there you go. Okay. So I believe 130 Farzad. is correct. You might want to double check. Yes, and I think 130 might be correct. Farzad gets the present. I, I, I will, I have the numbers, I have the entire numbering in my notes for the whole thing, okay? I'll, I'll, I'll show you that later, okay? But because we're, I, I want to stay on, on task, I'm, 
we're in this paragraph set, we're going to be talking about the uniqueness of the covenant and administration. Now, the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is in the United States, um, during um, at one point in time, had a deepening committee. This is during the 1970s, and they put out an incredible, incredible compilation called The Covenant and Administration. And years ago, I typed up the whole thing, okay? And this is like a 100-page compilation, and I put it online because it is a masterpiece of, as a compilation, um, showing um, the uniqueness of this covenant, pulling all the quotes from Christendom, uh, how it has ties to the Baha'i faith, and how this, this uh, covenant brought by His, um, by his Holiness the uh, Baha'u'llah, you know, the, the center of the covenant, Abdul Baha, the beloved guardian, and uh, with the, uh, the Universal House of Justice as these twin institutions. It is such a masterpiece that I encourage you, I will send the link of the covenant and administration. It's online. And we're so blessed, dear friends, to have so many incredible resources to, to explore the covenant from Adi Tarhizadeh's masterpieces, right? On the covenant, the child of the covenant, the covenant and Baha'u'llah, with all of these um, books on the covenant. I encourage you to study on the covenant. And if you are, have not had the privilege, and even if you have had the privilege of taking Ruhi Book 8, take it again. Because your understanding matures as you study it. You know, it's not like, oh, I've taken Ruhi Book 1 before. I don't need ever to take a Ruhi Book 1 ever again. Nah. Your understanding changes. You learn things in different contexts. So even a, a quote that you think you may know, it's wisdom, how it applies in different scenarios, and also hearing from other friends how it applies to them. And it helps you mature in your conversation. So I encourage you, especially uh, Ruhi Book 8 on the covenant. The beloved guardian brings in this incredible uh, topic of Peter the Apostle and, and, and Imam Ali in uh, this paragraph set 96 through 100. And we're going to be reading the quotes on Peter the Apostle as well as Imam Ali. In this paragraph set, we're going, the really the beloved guardian is wanting to show not only the uniqueness, but the significance of this new entity that has entered the world, the administration, the Baha'i administrative order, the significance of it, the Baha'i administration, as well as the world order. It's an incredible paragraph, Seth. So uh, without any further ado, we have time. Let us read these paragraphs. So we'll really be getting into it next week, uh, but let's read them for today. This is a long paragraph. And so um, I'm going to read this one so not to burden any of the dear friends, okay? And then you guys will read the next one, okay? So paragraph 96. It should be noted in this connection that this administrative order is fundamentally different from anything that any prophet has previously established, inasmuch as Baha'u'llah has himself revealed its principles established its institutions, appointed the person to interpret his word, and conferred the necessary authority on the body designed to supplement and apply his legislative ordinances. Therein lies the secret of its strength, its fundamental distinction, and the guarantee against disintegration and schism. Nowhere in the sacred scriptures of any of the world's religious systems, nor even in the writings of the inaugurator of the Babi dispensation, do we find any provisions establishing a covenant or providing for an administrative order that can compare in scope and authority 
with those that lie at the very basis of the Baha'i dispensation. Has either Christianity or Islam, to take as an instant two of the most widely diffused and outstanding among the world's recognized religions, anything to offer that can measure with or be regarded as equivalent to either the book of Baha'u'llah's covenant or to the will and testament of Abdul Baha? Does the text of either the gospel or the Quran confer sufficient authority upon these leaders and councils that have claimed the right and assumed the function of interpreting the provisions of their sacred scriptures and of administering the affairs of their respective communities? Could Peter, the admitted chief of the apostles, or the Imam Ali, the cousin and legitimate successor of the prophet, produce in support of the primacy with which both had been invested, written and explicit affirmations from Christ and Muhammad that could have silenced those who either among their contemporaries or in a later age have repudiated their authority and by their action precipitated the schisms that persist until the present day. Where, we may confidently ask, in the recorded sayings of Jesus Christ, whether in the matter of succession or in the provision of a set of specific laws and clearly defined administrative ordinances as distinguished from purely spiritual principles, can we find anything approaching the detailed injunctions, laws, and warnings that abound in the authenticated utterances of both Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha. Can any passage of the Quran, which in respect to its legal code, its administrative and devotional ordinances, marks already a notable advance over previous and more corrupted revelations, be construed as placing upon an unassailable basis the undoubted authority with which Muhammad had verbally and on several occasions, invested his successor? Can the author of the Babi dispensation, however much he may have succeeded through the provisions of the Persian Bayan, in averting a schism as permanent and catastrophic as those that afflicted Christianity and Islam, can he be said to have produced instruments for the safeguarding of his faith as definite and efficacious as those which must for all time preserve the unity of the organized followers of the faith of Baha'u'llah. Dear Tesfaya, could you read this one for us? Sure. Alone of all the revelations gone before, it this phase has, through the explicit directions, the repeated warnings, the authenticated safeguards incorporated and elaborated in its teachings, succeeded in raising a structure which the bewildered followers of the bankrupt and broken creeds might well approach and critically examine and seek ere it is too late. The invaluable, invulnerable security of its world embracing shelter. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. And paragraph 98. Dear Zamruhi John, if you could read this one for us. No wonder that he, who through the operation of his will, has inaugurated so vast and unique an order, and who is the center of so mighty a covenant, should have written these words. So firm and mighty is this covenant, 
that from the beginning of time until the present day, no religious dispensation have produced its like. Whatsoever is latent in the innermost of this holy cycle, he wrote during the darkest and most dangerous days of his ministry, shall gradually appear and be made manifest. For now is but the beginning of its growth and the day spring of the revelation of its sign. Fear not are his reassuring words foreshadowing the rise of the administrative order established by his will. Fear not if this branch be severed from this material world and cast aside its leaves. Nay, the leaves thereof shall flourish for this branch will grow after it is cut off from this world below. It shall reach the loftiest pinnacles of glory and it shall bear such fruits as will perfume the world with their fragrance. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. In paragraph 99, Farzad John, yes, you're right there. Sure. To what else, if not to the power and majesty which this administrative order, the rudiments of the future all enfolding Baha'i Commonwealth is destined to manifest, can these utterance of Baha'u'llah allude. The world's equilibrium had been upset through the vibrating influence of this most great, this new world order. Mankind's ordered life had been revolutionized through the agency of this unique, this wondrous system, the like of which mortal eyes have never witnessed. What a powerful quote from Baha'u'llah. And paragraph 100, okay. Let us, Riaz, John, if you could kindly read this one for us. The Bob himself. In the course of his references to him whom God will make manifest. Anticipates the system and glorifies the world order which the revelation of Baha'u'llah is destined to unfold. Well is it with him is his remarkable statement in the third chapter of the Persian Bayan who fixes his gaze upon the order of Baha'u'llah and rendereth thanks unto his Lord, for he will assuredly be made manifest. God hath indeed irrevocably ordained it in the Bayan. Thank you so much, Riaz John. So here we are, dear friends. These are the paragraphs 96 through 100. Paragraph 96, this long paragraph with multiple questions, one after another, talking about this fundamental difference of this administrative order revealed by Baha'u'llah. It's difference. Real John, please, you have a hand, please. Well, thank you. Exactly as you are saying. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't no, mean no, to interrupt. absolutely. Go ahead. But, but in our culture, mm -hmm. in human culture everywhere, administration is nothing special. <laughs> it's simply a red tape or what? what bureaucracy. What the, bureaucracy, rules, regulations that that uh, people hate it actually 
people hate has has right. no and um, of, of course <clears throat> these administ uh, administrative systems in, in culture uh, of course they safeguard the order uh, of uh, social affairs mm -hmm. and they don't have this anything beyond that except record names record marriages etc etc uh, councils uh, etc uh, but here uh, it, it seems that this when we say in the baha'i world view when we say administrative order mm -hmm. it's it, 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 we have to learn that this is a new administrative order it's not what we are accustomed to as administration of affairs this embodies a lot more absolutely and we have to learn what more there is and what are as you said the significance we have to learn what what is the significance of this administrative order uh, and this is an educational process um, that will strengthen our spiritual uh, strengthen our spiritual perception of human life of human society uh, and and so the, we have to start learning uh, all over again mm -hmm. the, the 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 significance of this what uh, it's called the administrative order. No, oh, you're spot on, dear Rios John. Um, a quote from the Kitab Akhdas is uh, very apt here, where Baha'u'llah says, Think not that we have revealed unto you a mere code of laws. It's the mere code of laws. Nay, rather, we have unsealed the choice wine with the fingers of might and power. To this beareth witness that which the pen of revelation hath revealed. Meditate upon this, O man of insight. Unseal the choice wine. Wine capital W. It's not the, <laughs> the grapes that would make a Napa Valley or, you know, the, uh, the, the unsealed choice wine, capital W, means the revelation. This is the revelation that have come. The spirit, the divine essence has been unsealed. The mysteries have been unlocked. This has, is what has, been, uh, has now been unlocked for all humanity. It is not just do this, drink this, you know, do not eat this. Um, fast from this time to this time, say these prayers um, and be robotic. This faith is so much more. This is a faith that will transform humanity from being animalistic in nature, in the sense, to being of worthy of being the companion of his Lord and being of a servant in the sense. And this is an interesting thing. Anywhere else, when you hear the word servant, it's something bad. <laughs> to, but in the, when you hear the word servant in the faith, it's something so laudable and praiseworthy, right? It's, you hear, oh, but the reality is to be of service to your Lord, to be of worthy of doing that. That is our highest hope and highest aspiration to be of service to our Lord. This is what this faith is about, really. There's nothing. And through this transformation of our hearts, we can become a vehicle of his word. That's really what it's about. So through our actions, our mouthpieces can become vehicles. Our our actions daily can become vehicles of his word because his word is the creative word. If I'm just holding it, if I, if I just leave it on the bookshelf, the word, that's it. 
You got to live it. You got to breathe it. You got to do it. You got to enact it. You know, that's how the word becomes flesh. By the way, that was another George Townsend book. The word becomes flesh. Okay. But the reality is when you breathe it in and how do you do that, dear friends? You got to study, you got to read, you got to learn, you got to internalize. So you, when it says, remember my days during thy days and my distress and banishment in this remote prison, it's not like, oh, I'm only reading the tablet of Ahmed and I remember, oh, Baha'u'llah was in a prison. You know, he was in a bunch of prisons, you know, and I remember that, you know, <laughs> he was in Akka, he was in Siachal, he was in... He was in Adrianople. He was in Constantinople. I remember that. Yeah, I remember that. But what do you, what do you remember? <laughs> remember his sacrifice. What did he do for humanity? What did he do for you? Most importantly, because bring it home. Bring this faith home. Sure, Baha'u'llah did everything for humanity, but he also did it for Zamru Hijan. He did it for Zafar Hijan. He did it for Riyaz Hijan. He did it for Miss Yuta Miller. Baha'u'llah sacrificed his whole life for you. It's so important. If you bring it the faith home, you'll realize, what do I have to do for him now? I got a lot to do. I got a lot of work. I always remember the quote from, you know, John F. Kennedy, God bless him. He says, you know, it's not what." You know, the country does for you is what you do for the country, right? You know, I paraphrase. But it's the same thing is for the faith. What are you doing for Baha'u'llah? The faith is doing everything for you. It's given, Baha'u'llah has given the sacrifice, everything you've given it. But it's a two-way street. That's why it's called a covenant. He's given this to you. This. Now, what are you giving back to Baha'u'llah? What is your service? What is your daily sacrifice? What is your daily form of teaching? What are you doing? So that's something to think about. Ponder, remember, day by day, ruse by ruse. Become a better you, right? Become a better you every day. And so these are things that I, I, love, I love to, you know, every so often, especially as we were studying so intently Advent of Divine Justice, the beloved guardian hit that subject whole transformation. Through rectitude of conduct, chaste and holy life, freedom from racial prejudices, hits it home to be a different person, right? Especially in uh, our primary mode of our lives, which is should be the teaching work. Because we need to transform ourselves to be a mouthpiece for Baha'u'llah. So, and this instrument, this unique instrument that has been created by Baha'u'llah is this administrative order. Nothing like it has ever been created before in the, in the history of world's religion. This is the beloved garden. It should be noted. Fundamentally different from anything that any prophet has previously established. In as much as Baha'u'llah himself. Now Baha'u'llah is who? Manifestation of God himself has revealed its principles. So the administrative order, the principles of it, Baha'u'llah has brought into being. Its institutions, Baha'u'llah has brought into being. Baha'u'llah has appointed the person to interpret his word, namely Abdul Baha. He appointed him. And has conferred the necessary authority on the body designed to supplement and apply his legislative ordinances. In the Kitab Ahdas, it mentions the universal house of justice. It's all there. So Baha'u'llah himself has brought in this administrative order. Now, if that was solely it, we will, but remember how, many, how much we have learned about the will and testament of Abdu'l-Bah. Complementary in every aspect. So this the, now we, the will and testament, the covenant, or to the will and testament of Abdullah. Nothing. Here it says has aided Christianity or Islam to take as an instant two of the most widely diffused and outstanding among the world's recognized religions. I love how the beloved guardian writes. This is something as every Baha'i should 
learn in their speaking. Okay? Never, absolutely, categorically, never does the beloved guardian, when he wants to make a point about, per se, the difference or, or uniqueness of the faith in comparison to any faith prior, does he ever belittle the faith or the former faith? You see what he's how he does it? He doesn't ever belittle the former faith. But look at the language. Has either Christianity or Islam, to take as an instance, two of the most widely diffused and outstanding among the world's recognized religions, anything to offer that can measure with or be regarded as equivalent to either the Book of Baha'u'llah's Covenant or to the Will and Testament of Abdu'l-Bah. He's not belittling those faiths. But he is actually praising those faiths, right? Now, it's the, he praises the manifestations of God. He praises the faiths. But he makes very clear that the faiths have gone askew in many of his writings. The followers of the faiths have lost the spirit of the manifestations of God. He makes it very clear. That's, that's the reality. But... Um, could Peter, the admitted chief of the apostles, or the Imam Ali, the cousin and legitimate successor of the prophet, produce in support of the primacy, which both have been invested in written and explicit affirmations from Christ and Muhammad, that could have silenced those who either among the contemporaries or a later age have repudiated authority. No one, he's saying no one can have produced the likes of what Abdu'l-Bahá produced as the will and testament of abdul -Bahá. This is a unique, and I encourage you to read the Covenant of Baha'u'llah. Read the Child of the Covenant. These are books of um, Adib Tarhizade, the uniqueness of this covenant. There's nothing like it. Nothing, nothing. And that's why I say read, 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 read. I cannot stress this enough because knowledge is something that, you know, a lot of people enjoy listening to lectures because it's passive, you know? You hear, it, you know, hear someone else talking and you kind of like get it, you know, through here. Why, I, you know, some, one of my students in a long time ago when I was teaching Sunday school, long, long time ago, I'm an old man now, graying hair, you know? When I was teaching Sunday school, uh, one of my students was like, Esan, why do you teach? You know, why do you teach Sunday school? I mean, you're the youngest teacher in the Sunday school. I think I was like 14 or 15 when I started, honestly. And I was like, and I was like, so they were like, why do you teach? And the reality is you learn more than anyone else. You learn more. Remember, dear friends. This faith is yours. Baha'u'llah has gifted it to you. It's the most precious thing. If you've been born a Baha'i, fantastic. You've been gifted it by your parents. It's the greatest gift your parents have ever given. If you learned of it and found it, it is the greatest thing that you have found. The greatest treasure. Hold on to it. But study it. Learn it. First and foremost, teach yourself so that you may become a vehicle to teach others. Then another question was, Esan, do you want to get married? I said, yes, of course I want to get married. Do you want to have children? I said, yes, of course I want to have children. He said, why do you want to have children? It says right there in Kitab Ahdas, have a family so, and have a wife to, so that you will bring forth one who will make mention of me. So the, right there, the purpose of a family and having children is to bring forth one who will make mention of me. Make mention of me means that your children will become a teacher of the cause of God. In essence, if your children are not teaching, that union as a spouse and husband and wife is actually not really abiding by the principle of what that Baha'u'llah has said that union is supposed to be about. You follow? Bring forth one who will make mention of me. The entire purpose is teaching. Teach, teach. 
The reality is the greatest gift that you have is the knowledge of him. The greatest gift. Do not hoard it like Smeagol and Gollum in the Lord of the Rings. You know, hold on to it. My precious, my precious, my faith. Or wait till you think they are ready. I don't think that person's ready yet for me to open my mouth about who, you know, this or that. Who are you to hold on to this faith and make those assumptions? Does everyone in your circle know that you are a Baha'i? That's something that you should be thinking about. Does everyone in your circle know that you are a Baha'i? And are you standing out as a Baha'i? Are you standing out as a Baha'i? In, if you're in your workspace, by your ethics, by your moral character, by your you know, justice, by your kindliness. I mean, I have so many examples of kindliness you know, in my daily work, you know, treating the employees with such care and love. You know, how, you know, I, I, I'll give you an example. Like today, in my own working environment, one of my staff, she's a wonderful, wonderful lady. And I, I'm absolutely sure she won't be watching this video. So, but I, this, but I, I, this staff, wonderful lady, right? What happened was she, I, I asked her, she's like a office manager secretary. And I said, please register everyone for this oil and gas conference. Every Register everyone. And I didn't mention her, you know, that she, I want, you know, so I asked her, do you want to attend this conference? She said, yes, Hassan, it would be nice. I said, don't, don't worry about it. Register yourself. She was so shocked at per se the generosity, the nicety of that example, you know, of care, you know, and it's not that much money, but it's just the, just to show that we care about our, you know, staff, our, our coworkers, our friends, that it sets us apart, you know? And as a Baha'i, as if you work at a company, you know, how you act, how you behave, you have an image. And that's something important, dear friends. And every one of us should, you know, it's not just by hell holding a Baha'i ID in your wallet, you know, and saying, I am a Baha'i. You should hold the Baha'i ID here. It should be so part of you that it's who you are. You shouldn't just be a Baha'i on Sundays. You know, I show up at the Baha'i Center or I show up at a Ruhi class or a devotional. You should be a Baha'i 100% totality. That is something so important. We talked about this in our Advent, and I go back to this topic because it's of such importance. I know we're talking about the administrative order here in paragraphs, you know, this entire section, but this is such an important topic of teaching and character and, and um, our, as a Baha'i, living the life is something that is so fundamentally important that that's why I wanted to end on this point, you know, before getting into this entire section. And I, I didn't also want to start the study of this section because we didn't have much time left in the class to start going through all this paragraph set. But dear friends, any thoughts on either anything that we've studied or anything that has... Dear Miss Yuda, you have a hand, please. I was wondering... Did the Bab mention Baha'u'llah by name in one of his writings? Absolutely. Yes. He did, yes. Did he give him the name? Did he give him the name? No, he didn't give. But he did mention Baha'u'llah by name. You're absolutely right. He did. Yeah, he did. Okay. And um, it's, um, I actually cited it in, in an early... Or, um, and I'll send that to the class. That's a good question. Yeah, he actually did mention Baha'u'llah. And 
So in an earlier class, I actually shared that reference on that. I think we have, yeah, we have that. Yeah, also, so pop quiz to the class based upon our study tonight. What percentage of hands of the cars are resting place in Haifa? Eight. Percentage, okay. percentage, ten, ten. percentage. Ten, ten. Percentage. 20. 20%. percent. There you go, my math wizards. There you go. 10 over 50, 1 equals 1 over 5 equals 120%. So 20% oh, yeah. of the hands, their resting place is in Haifa. Yeah, that's right. So there you go, dear friends. This is our, we finished up paragraphs 91 through 95. We're well past halfway through our, our course on dispensation. Any last question before we close it out tonight? Or learning? I think is, everything is great. Is dispensation of Baha'u'llah, how, how, do you, how do you see dispensation of Baha'u'llah different than the advent? Advent of Divine Justice, because a lot of you went through the Advent of Divine Justice. So how do you see Dispensation of Baha'u'llah different than his Advent book? is something that you are going to do, because that is our work as a Baha'i, a task that we are going to do it. But Dispensation of Baha'u'llah is to be the main principles and the main laws and ordinance and everything is to be here the way I see it. So this is the tools that you have to have and then go to the advent. Very, very good, very good, dear Tesva. You're paying attention as they say, right? So Advent of Divine Justice written in 1938, December 25th, 1938, right? That text was written to the North American Baha'i community, and that one was for um, to launch the first seven-year plan without a hitch, to give the Baha'i community of North America, and obviously the whole world, the tools to take on the long-standing evils, corruption, laxity of moral character, racism. These major long-standing evils, especially in the North American uh, community, where racism is still currently rampant. So the beloved guardian addressed this, these laxity of moral character by presenting his, his weapons, which is rectitude of conduct, to combat corruption, a chaste and holy life, to combat racism. He presents uh, freedom from all racial prejudices. So he presents his solutions and he says, these are my weapons, but this is not all there is. Then he said, presents his next tool set. He says, as a Baha'i, you also have to deepen yourselves, right? You got to deepen yourselves. Paragraph 75, he says, deepen, deepen, deepen. Learn the laws, the teachings, the tenets, the principles of the faith. Study the Quran, study these things. And this is where it is about the transformation. And all of this, everything you guys have been doing is for what? The beloved guardian builds up. It's like a symphony. He starts off so, you know, he starts off. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. He's saying, this is, this is the problem. This is the problem. Then now he's saying, this is my solution. I think it's like little chiming coming. And then he says, now, okay, now the whole thing, the whole symphony is coming together. And the whole thing is for what? Teaching. 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 Now we're reaching his point. Why the whole thing is for? It's for teaching to go and pioneer, to go and out, because in that point in time was for teaching. Now so at that point, the beloved guardian says the whole thing is for teaching. He says that as a Baha'i, that should be the dominating passion of your lives, the hallmark of your epicenter of your existence to become a voice for your Lord, to open your tongue. Its highest point for your tongue is to voice Baha'u'llah. Yeah. That is the entire, you know, if you think about it, the highest point in the sense, 
than that your ear could do is hear the words of Baha'u'llah. The highest thing that your tongue can do is to utter the words of Baha'u'llah. The highest thing that your eyes could do is to see the words of Baha'u'llah. Do, do we have the, the few tables listing the hands of the cause? Did we receive those or will be receiving? I'll, oh, the tables that I have in the in the in yes. here in, in the slides. Yes, yeah, two or three tables. I'll send that. I'll send the whole. I'll actually send the, the this uh PowerPoint so you have that. Oh, okay, very good. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries. Excellent, dear friends. So that was uh, concludes our class for tonight. Um, very happy as always to see each one of you. Makes my week. Okay, let us have a closing prayer and then um, we'll pick it up next week. Uh, okay, uh, who would like to share a prayer for tonight? And as always, dear friends, remember all the friends that are sick and ailing. You know, that's something, we, you know, we should always do that because there's so many dear friends that um are, have afflictions. We need to always remember them in our prayers. And not just remember them in our prayers, but give them a call. Give them, as they say, a shout out of love, okay? If you know who they are, okay? Thank you so much, dear friends. Thank you. Right. Let's see. And to thee be praised, O Lord my God, I entreat thee by thy signs that have encompassed the entire creation and by the light of thy countenance that has illuminated all that are in heaven and on earth and by thy mercy that has surpassed all created things and by thy grace that has suffused the whole universe to render sounder the bells that shut me out from thee, that I may hasten unto the fountain head of thy mighty inspiration, and to the day spring of thy revelation and bountiful favors, and may be immersed beneath the ocean of thy nearness and pleasure. Suffer me not, O my Lord to be deprived of the knowledge of thee in thy days, and divest me not of the robe of thy guidance. Give me to drink of the river of that is life indeed, whose waters have streamed forth from the paradise of Rizvan in the bracket in which the throne of thy name, the all merciful, was established that mine eyes may be opened and my face be illumined and my heart be as assured and my soul be enlightened and my steps be made firm. Thou art he who from everlasting was through the potency of his might, supreme over all things, and through the operation of his will, was able to ordain all things, nothing whatsoever, whether in thy heaven or in thy earth, can frustrate thy purpose. Have mercy, then upon me, O my Lord, through thy gracious providence and generosity, and incline mine ear to the sweet melodies of the birds that warble their praise of thee, amidst the branches of the tree of thy wonders. Thou art the great giver, the ever forgiving, the most compassionate, the howler. Well, thank you so much, every one of you. Thank you, dear Tesfaya. Thank you, every one thank of you. you. And have a wonderful evening, you guys. It was thank, the same, you, right? thank, thank you, Thank you, Alaupa. Good night, Alaupa. Good night, Alaupa. Good night, Alaupa. Good night, Alaupa.